Thank you so much for having me here. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be at TEDx Amman. The situation in Palestine is a multifaceted problem, encompassing economics, healthcare, education, and last but not least, politics. However, almost everybody focuses their full attention on mending the political situation, which overshadows other problems and neglects Palestine's most precious asset, its human capital. This is by no means meant to undermine the role of the political situation or its impact on the rest of the other problems, but, it, but rather an attempt to recognize applicable solutions. It is, one can argue, well, go ahead and solve the political problems and everything else would be okay. Let's think a little bit. How long have we been working on politics? 50, 70 years, you name it. My approach, however, is to serve Palestine and the people of Palestine by seeking solutions for way less complex problems, such as brain function. One of the major challenges to healthcare in Palestine is the very high prevalence of clinical depression, affecting around 40% of the population in the West Bank, which is estimated to be around one million Palestinians in a population, 65% of which is under the age of 24. Can you imagine? 40% of Palestinians in the West Bank have clinical depression. It becomes clear how prevalent depression is in Palestine when compared to other countries in the world. Would you imagine what life would be like in the US, UK, China, if 40% of the population is clinically depressed? I can't even start thinking about it. It's worth noting, however, that depression is different than clinical depression. Depression is a normal emotional state that is related to sadness and bereavement and can be experienced by anybody. However, when these emotions are exaggerated and go beyond limits, persist, and interfere with daily life activities, the Diagnosis of clinical depression is considered. What I'm speaking about here is clinical depression, not depression. However, the problems that are facing brain health in Palestine are not limited to the very high prevalence of mental health disorders, but are rather compounded by many other obstacles, including the very high degrees of social stigma inhibiting patients and their families from seeking mental health in Palestine. I've seen numerous patients and numerous patient chaperones in clinics whose only concern was to leave the clinic and not be seen by others while attending a mental health clinic. Quite disappointing, but this is what we have. Also, the very insufficient number of mental health professionals and facilities available for the care of those suffering from brain disorders in Palestine is another hindering problem. It doesn't stop here though. The problems to brain health do not stop here, but are, the, are rather compounded by other obstacles in brain power in Palestine. With limited to non-existent capacity for biomedical research in Palestine on brain disorders, and a growing brain drain where the best and brightest Palestinians are tempted to move abroad to the US and Europe to pursue careers and gain money. Such a complex problem, really stratified and, and, and complicated. But what should we do? Just give up and say that, okay, there's nothing that we can do. Let's just let it go and um, things will finally resolve themselves. I don't, I don't see this as a solution. The solution is to be able to recognize the fact that failure is not an option and believe in our abilities. Can we utilize the relatively young, genetically uniform population and the very high number of unmedicated patients? Can we use all these characteristics of Palestinians to turn 
all these disadvantages into advantages to manage to properly use the problem to the advantage of Palestinians and Palestine, well, how can we get that done? It's not easy. One can tell me, well, we have nothing. We don't have expertise, we don't have personnel, we don't have the infrastructure. Well, let's build that. Let's start from zero. What do we need in order to get this accomplished? We need expertise, and we can accomplish that by partnering with a world-class institution that has expertise in this particular field. We need personnel. We can definitely train people, invest in people, train young people to handle similar problems, and we need support in order to be able to build infrastructure, moral and financial support, in order to move forward in this direction. In 2008, my colleagues and I at Rutgers University in Newark and Al-Quds University established the Rutgers Al-Quds Brain Research Exchange Program to partner with one of these institutions to build expertise for our work in Palestine. Following that, we launched a very, I would say, you know, uh, interesting initiative in Palestine, we, where we are trying to promote brain health and brain power in Palestine. We call this initiative the Palestinian Neuroscience Initiative. It is based in Palestine at Al-Quds University. And Al-Quds University is located in Abu Dis, a Palestinian town on the outskirts of Jerusalem. With a group of very motivated medical students, doctors, therapists, specialists, and faculty at Al-Quds Medical School, whose only aim is to promote brain health, brain power, and research in Palestine. We are integrating training, research, and patient care in order to improve brain health and brain power in Palestine. We are training the next generation of Palestinian biomedical professionals in cooperation with elite institutions in the US and Europe on neuroscience research and brain disorder research. Our students benefit from short and long-term clerkships where they can go abroad, get trained, and our only condition is for them to return back to Palestine and apply what they have learned. Over the past four years, we have graduates that we are proud of and represent the best ambassadors of Palestine. One of our graduates was recently selected as one of three international research fellows by the International Brain Research Organization. And that's at the level of the world. Over the past four years, we have published eight papers in international journals. We have sent 15 researchers to conferences to present their work. We have trained 35 medical students and 20 specialists on neurocognitive research in Palestine on Palestinian subjects. We have received a very prestigious award from the National Institutes of Health in the US. We are training four of Al-Quds Medical School graduates in PhD and residency programs in the US. We're going to ultimately return back to Palestine to help build this further. We have sent 14 medical students to Harvard, to EPFL, to CISA, to Columbia, to Rutgers for short-term trainings, after which they return back to, pa to Palestine to apply what they have learned. We invited nine top-notch professors to Al-Quds University to give trainings on neuroscience. And we have held two mini-symposia at Al-Quds University on neuroscience. It's not the end of the story. We are conducting local but internationally recognized research on brain disorders and mental disorders in Palestine. We have managed for the first time ever by a research group in the world to delineate the negative impact of antidepressant medications on cognitive function. We show that antidepressants not only impair cognitive function in major depressive disorder patients, but also limit their ability to make appropriate decisions in their daily life activities. In a recent study that we have published, we looked at rule generalization in clinical depression and the effects of antidepressants. What we found was really stunning. We found that antidepressant medications actually impair our ability to generalize rules that we have already learned 
And this is the first time in the world anybody ever finds such a, such a, a result. In a different study, looking at learning from positive versus negative feedback in clinical depression and the effects of antidepressants, we found that antidepressants do not improve the cognitive deficit that is already there due to the depression, but rather impair negative feedback learning in patients with, major de with clinical depression, causing them ultimately to become very vulnerable to impulsions, impulsive control disorders, and being unable to make decisions that fit their daily life needs. We're also starting a couple of projects on genetics, where we're looking at particular genes as they relate to brain function. Recently, we managed to identify two loci in two different genes that would predict with a very high level of probability the, 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 the likelihood of a Palestinian subject developing depression later in life. It's not only that. We're also educating patients and their families about mental disorders. And making sure that they, they understand and know what are the best treatment options available in Palestine for clinical depression and for other mental disorders. Over the past three, four years, we have helped more than 600 patients and their families learn about the disorder and get the best treatment and diagnosis possible. I know that we have one million more to go, but you know, it's, a, it's quite an achievement. <laughs> in 2009, I would like to share this story with you. In 2009, I saw one of the patients who had a very severe form of depression. After getting the proper diagnosis, I spent more than two hours with that patient, testing her or on our research batteries and making sure that she knows what her, where her state is, what her disease is. You know, sometimes you forget about people that you meet or get to talk to sometimes. You know, like, this is memory, this is life, this is humans. Two years later, I was in the same clinic. I was also seeing patients. Two ladies came to the clinic, a patient and her cousin. I was really amazed with the amount of enthusiasm. And I can't really describe it. I don't find the words to describe the, the, um, the situation there. That lady, the, the chaperone, the patient chaperone, was, was a, a very power, powerful person. She had a great will to help her cousin and was very knowledgeable of the disorder that she had. After testing the other patient, who was the, the other cousin, and, and finishing the clinic, I, I said, wait, I know that chaperone. I know that lady. That's the lady from two years ago that I diagnosed as, a, as a, a case of major depressive disorder and treated and educated. She did not only get better, but also try, is trying and is working actively in her close environment to learn and teach people about major depressive disorder. And she brought a patient to the clinic. This is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach Palestinians about these disorders and make sure that they are not ashamed of speaking about them and not ashamed of seeking health care. <laughs> Innovation is not only limited to technology. In my point of view, and it's quite biased, I would say innovation is about finding smart approaches and smart ways to make the world that we live in a better place to live. If you succeed despite hardships and manage to find smart ways to solve your problems, this is innovation. If you manage to change an erroneous societal approach to a particular problem, this is innovation. But what is disruptive about what we're doing? It is all being done in Palestine by Palestinians to serve Palestinians. We are aspiring to use these opportunities, not only help Palestinians, but also to help the whole world and to aid patients with clinical depression in the whole world. And that's not far. It's very close. And I can see it in the horizon. We belong to a region in the world that has been known for centuries and millennia 
as a source of disruptive innovations in science and technology. Why not go back there? Why not try to go on the same track again? It is difficult. It is going to take time. But the best time to start is now. The Palestinian Neuroscience Initiative is hopefully going to evolve in a couple of years into the Palestinian Neuroscience Institute at Al-Quds University. We're hoping that by the time this institute is up and about, this will start having an impact on other fields and other professionals and let them start think, okay, we can do this. This is possible. Somebody did it in neuroscience. Why don't we do it in cardiology? Why don't we do it in physics? Unfortunately, I'm not going to be involved, but why don't we do it in cancer? We need a scientific Arab Spring that can spread across countries. <laughs> that can cross borders and spread uh, uh, to other countries. The first of which is going to be Jordan. And believe me, the situation here is not that different from Palestine. The prevalence of clinical depression is between 25 and 30 percent in Jordan. What I'm trying to tell you is it is going to take time. It is going to take effort. But with perseverance, with, as one of my colleagues said, tawakkul, and just moving forward, and don't listen to people who are trying to put you down, we can get a lot of stuff accomplished in this country. Our initiative and programs make and will continue to make formidable contributions to healthcare and education in Palestine while creating a powerhouse for neuroscience research at Al-Quds University in Palestine. We want to stop the brain drain. We want to tell Palestinian scientists all over the world and other Arab scientists that we have facilities in our home countries that can host them and can provide to them the infrastructure that they need to run their research. With few natural resources and very modest space, the future of Palestine can only be based on its most precious asset, human capital, building brain power to improve brain health, which can turn a dusty, empty, dark room that has no life at all into a room full of life, ambition, and motivated individuals to make a change and shape the future of Palestine. Thank you.